Once upon a time, or many, many years ago, as time is calculated by men, but which was only yesterday in the celestial calendar of heaven, there was in paradise a most miserable, totally unhappy, and utterly dejected cherub who was known throughout heaven as the littlest angel. He was exactly four years, six months, five days, seven hours, and 42 minutes of age when he presented himself to the old, old gatekeeper in wait to be led into the glorious kingdom of heaven. Standing defiantly, he tried to pretend that he was not at all impressed by such unearthly splendor, and that he wasn't at all afraid to know. But his lower lip trembled and a tear disgraced him by making a new furrow down his already tear-streaked face, coming to a quick stop halt at the very tip end of his small, freckled nose. But that wasn't all. While the kindly old gatekeeper was hearing the name in his great book, the littlest angel, having left home at usual without a handkerchief, endeavored to hide the telltale evidence by snuffing a most unangelic sound which so unnerved the good gatekeeper that he did something he had never did before in all eternity. He blocked the page. From that moment on, the heavenly peace was never quite the same and the littlest angel soon became the despair of all the heavenly hosts. His shrill, tear-splitting whistle resounded all hours through the golden streets. It startled the old prophet and disturbed the meditation. Yes, and on top of that, he inevitably and loudly sang off-key at the singing practice of the heavenly choir, spoiling its heavenly effect. And being so small that it seemed to take him just twice as long as anyone else to get to nightly prayer, the little angel always arrived late and always knocked everyone's wings lopsided as he darted into his place. Although these flaw in behavior might have been overlooked, the general appearance of the little angel was even more disreputable than his conduct. It was first whispered among the seraphim and cherubim and then said aloud, the angel and archangel, that he didn't even look like an angel. And they were all quite correct. He did not. His halo was permanently tarnished, where he held on to it with one hot little shelby hand when he ran, and he was always running. Also, too, even when he stood very still, he never behaved as a halo should. He was always slipping down over his right eye, or over his left eye, or else, just for pure meanness, slipping off the back of his head and rolling away down some golden street just so he'd have to chase after it. Yes, it must be here recorded that his wings were neither useful nor ornamental. All paradise held its breath when the littlest angel perched himself like an unhappy fledgling sparrow on the very hedge of a gilded clod and prepared to take off. He would teeter this way and that way, but after much coaxing and a few false starts, he would shut both his eyes, hold his freckled nose and count up to 303 and then throw himself slowly into space. However, Owing to the regrettable fact that he always forgot to move his wing, the littlest angel always fell head over halo. He would also report and never deny that whenever he was nervous, which was most of the time, he bit his wing dip. Now anyone can easily understood why the littlest angel would soon or late have to be disciplined. And so on an eternal day of an eternal month in the year eternal, he was directed to present his small self before an angel of the peace. The little angel combed his hairs, dusted his wing, and donned an almost clean garment, and then, with a heavy heart, trudged his way to the place of judgment. He tried to postpone the dread ordeal by loitering along the street of the guarding angel, pausing a few timeless moments to minutely pursue the long list of new arrivals, although all heaven knew he could not read a word. And he idled more than several immoral moments to carefully examine a display of orient harp, although everyone in the celestial city knew he couldn't tell one note from another. But at length and at last, he slowly approached the doorway which was surmounted by a pair of golden scales, signifying that heavenly justice was dispensed within. To the little angel's greatest surprise, he heard a merry voice singing. The little angel removed his halo and breathed upon it heavily. Then polished it upon his garment, a procedure which added nothing to its already untidy appearance, and then tiptoed in. The singer, who was known as the Understanding Angel, looked down at the small culprit, 
and the little angel right now tried to make himself invisible by the smart process of withdrawing his head into the collar of his garment, very much like a snapping turtle. At that, the singer laughed. A jolly, heartwarming sound, he said, oh, so you're the one who's been making heaven so unheavenly. Come here, cherub, and tell me all about it. The little angel ventured a sly look. First one eye, and then the other eye. Suddenly, almost before he knew it, he was perched on the lap of the understanding angel and was explaining how very difficult it was for a boy who suddenly finds himself transformed into an angel. Yes, and no matter what the archangel say, he'd only swung once, went twice, oh, all right, then he'd swung three times on the golden gate. But that was just for something to do. That was the whole trouble. There wasn't anything for a small angel to do, and he was very homesick. Oh, not that paradise wasn't beautiful but the earth was beautiful too. Wasn't it created by God himself, huh? Why, there were trees to climb and brook to fish and cave to play at pirate chief. The swimming hole in sun and rain and dawn and thick brown dust, so soft and warm beneath your feet. Understand, angel smiled. In his high was a long forgotten memory of another small boy from long ago. Then he asked the little angel what would make him most happy in paradise. The cherub talked for a moment whispered in his ear, there's a box, I left it under my bed back home, if I could only have that. The understanding angel nod his head, you shall have it, he promised, and a fleet-winged heavenly messenger was instantly sent to bring the box to paradise. And then in all those timeless days that follow, everyone wondered at the great change in the littlest angel, for among all his cherubs in God's kingdom, he was the most happy. His conduct was above the slightest reproach. His appearance was all that the most fastidious could wish for. And on excursion to the Elysian fields, it could be said, and truly said, that he flew like an angel. Then it came to pass that Jesus, the Son of God, was to be born of Mary in Bethlehem of Judea. And as the glorious tidings spread through paradise, all the angels rejoiced in their voice were lifted to herald the miracle of miracles, the coming of the Christ child. Angel and arch angel, the seraphim and cherubim, the gatekeeper, the wingmaker, yes, and even the halo smith put aside their usual task to prepare their gift for the blessed infant. All but the littlest angel. He sat himself down on the topmost step of the golden stair and anxiously waited for inspiration. What could he give that would be most acceptable to the Son of God, huh? At one time, he dreamed of composing a lyric him of adoration. But the little angel was woefully wanting in musical talent, yeah. Then he grew tremendously excited over writing the prayer, a prayer that would live forever in the hearts of men, because it would be the first prayer ever to be heard by the Christ child. But the little angel was terribly lacking in writing skill. What, oh what, could a small angel give that would plead the holy infant, huh? Time of the miracle was very close at hand when the little angel at last decided on his gift. Then on that day of days, he proudly brought it from his hiding place behind the cloud and humbly, with downcast eye, placed it before the throne of God. It was only a small, rough, unsightly box, but inside were all those wondrous things that even a child of God would treasure. A small, rough, unsightly box lying among all those but a glorious gift from all the angels of paradise gifts of such rare and radiant splendor and breathless beauty that heaven and all the universe were lighted by the mere reflection of their glory. And when the littlest angel saw this, he suddenly knew that his gift to God's child was irreverent, and he devoutly wished he might reclaim his shabby gift. It was ugly. It was worthless. If only he could hide it away from the sight of God before it was even noticed. But it was too late. The hand of God moved slowly over all that bright array of shining gift, then paused, then dropped. Then came to rest on the lowly gift of the littlest angel. The littlest angel trembled as the box was opened, and there before the eyes of God and all his heavenly host was what he offered to the Christ child. And what was his gift to the blessed infant? Whatever the butterfly with golden wings captured one bright summer day on a hill above Jerusalem, and a sky blue egg from a bird's nest in the olive tree that stood to shade his mother's kitchen door. Yes. Two white stone, found on a muddy river bank, where he and his friend had played like small brown beaver, and at the bottom of the box, a limp, toothed 
mark, leather strap, once worn as a collar by his mongrel dog who had died as he had lived in absolute love and infinite devotion. The little angel wept hot bitter tears, for now he knew that instead of honoring the Son of God, he'd been most blasphemous. Why had he ever taught the box was so wonderful? Huh? Why had he dreamed that such utterly useless things would be loved by the blessed infant? In frantic terror, he turned to run and hide from the divine wrath of the heavenly Father, but he stumbled and fell, and with a horrified wail and clatter of halo, rolled in a ball of consummate misery to the very foot of the heavenly throne. That was ominous and dreadful silence in the celestial city. A silence complete and undisturbed, save for the heartbroken sobbing of the littlest angel. And then suddenly the voice of God spoke, saying, Of all the gifts of all the angels, I find that this small box pleases me most. Its content are of the earth and of men, and my son is born to be king of both. These are the things my son, too, will know and love and cherish, and then, regretful, will leave behind him when his task is done. I accept this gift in the name of the child Jesus, born of Mary this night in Bethlehem. That was a breathless pause. And then the rough, unsightly box of the littlest angel began to glow with a bright, unearthly light. Then the light became a lustrous flame, and the flame became a radiant brilliance that blinded the eye of all the angels. None but the littlest angel saw it rise from its place before the throne of God. And he, and only he, watched it arch the firmament to stand and shed its clear, white, bargaining light over a stable where a child was born. There it shone on that night of miracles. His light was reflected down the centuries deep in the heart of all mankind, yet earthly eyes, blinded too by its splendor, could never know that the lowly gift of the littlest angel was what all men would call forever the shining star of Bethlehem. For the night before Christmas, when all through the hours, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. Them stockings were hanged by the chimney with care and hope that St. Nicholas soon would be down. Them children were nestled all snug in them bed, while visions of sugar plum danced through their head. And Mama and her kerchief and me in my cap had just settled our brain down for a long winter nap. When out on the lawn there rose such a clatter, me I sprang from my bed to see what in the world was the matter. Away to the window, me I fly like a flash, tear open them shutter and throw up them sides. The moon on the breast of the new fall snow, giving a luster of midday to object below. When what to my wondering heart should appear, but a miniature sleigh and eight little bitty tiny reindeer. But a little old driver so lively and quick, me I knew in one moment it must be Saint Nick. More rapid than he goes, his course that they came. And he whistled and shouted and called him by name, now Dasher, now Dancer, now Prancer and Vixen. On coming, on Cupid, on Donner and Blitzen, to the top of them port, to the top of them wall. Now dash away, dash away, dash away hard. And lead it before the wild earth can fly, when they meet with an obstacle amount to the sky. So up to the house top, them courser they flew, with a sleigh full of thaw and St. Nicholas too. And then in a twinkle, a year on them roof, the prance and paw of each little bitty hoof. As I draw in my head and was turned around, down the chimney. St. Nicholas brought himself down with a bond. He was dressed all in fur from his head to his feet. And his clothes were all tarnished with ashes, even on the seat. A bundle of tar he had flung on his back. And he looked just like a peddler, opened his pack. His high hearty twinkled. His dimples are merry. His cheeks were like rose, his nose just like a sherry. His droll little mouth was drawn up like a bow. And the beard on his shin was as white as them snow. The stump of a pipe. He held tight with his teeth, and the smoke, it circled his head just like a reed. He had a broad face and a raw little belly that shook when he laughed just like a bowl plum full of jelly. He would chub it and plump, the right jolly old elf, and me, I laugh when I see him in spite with myself. A wink of his high, and a twist with his head, soon gave me to know I did not have one little bit of thing to dread. He speak not a word, no but went straight to his work and fell all them stockings, then turned with a jerk. And lay his finger right by the side of his nose. He give a big nod up them shimbly he rolled. He sprang to his sleigh, to his team give a whistle, and away they all fly like the down from a thistle. But I hear his scream, for he drive plumb out of sight, 
You are young and aware. Happy Christmas to all. And all a good night. One Christmas, when Santa Claus came to a certain house to fill the cheering stocking there, he found a little mouse. A Merry Christmas, little friend, said Sandy good and kind. The same to you, sir, said the mouse. I thought you wouldn't mind. If I should stay awake tonight and watch you for a while, you're very welcome, little mouse, said Sandy with a smile. And then he filled his stocking up before the mouse could wink. From toe to top, from top to toe, there wasn't left the sheep. Now they won't hold another thing, said Sandy Claus with pride. A twinkle came in the moss eye, but humbly he replied, It's not polite to contradict, you pardon me, I am blue, but in the fuller stocking there, me I could put one thing more. Oh, ho, laughed Sandy, silly moss, don't I know how to pack. By filling stocking all these years, me I should have learned the knack. And then he took the stocking down from where it hangs so high and said, Now put in one thing more I'll give you leave to try. The mouse is shuffled to himself, and then he softly stole right to the stocking's crowded door and gnawed it little old. Now, if you please, good Santa Claus, me I'll put in one thing more, or you will own that little hole was not in there before. Now Santa Claus did laugh and laugh, and then he gave his phone. Well, you shall have a Christmas cheese for that nice little joke. If you don't think this story is true, I can show it to you. Now, very stocking with the hole, the little mouse not true. Have you been told that you have a year of the curious, furious, fidgety year when Sandy Claus unhitched his sleigh and bowed? He was took a holiday, huh? How did it happen? This way. It was long ago before you were living, not yet Christmas, but past Thanksgiving. Though I can't give you the very date. Sandy got up that morning late, put on one boot, then it's twin, rubbed a whiskey on his shin, and sat back down on the side of the bed. Great North Star, but me I'm tired, he said. Hating wagons, red and bright, sharpening ice skates half the night, wrapping presents in ribbon and gauze. Has worn me weary, said Sandy Claus, pricking my back, holding my nose, aching my finger and all ten toes, and a sort of a kind of a kick inside whenever I think of that Christmas ride. And to his workroom to limp the seat, he sniffed the varnish, he smelled the paint, and a reeling feeling come over him, stealing the seat tin cram from floor to ceiling, a rocking horse with shaggy mane, ball, doll, electric train, glove, mitt, doctor kit, Rubber boot, cowboy suit, kite for flying in park, bicycle, no law. And he started to shake and he started to shiver at the thought of the load he must soon deliver. And he sighed, oh dear, as he buttoned his vest, I wish one year me I could took a rest. When the word were out, he stood stock still. And then he whispered, I think I will. I will, he cried with his eyes ablaze. Everyone else get holiday. Sailor and tailor and cook do, policeman and writer of book do, tamer of lion and leopard, preacher and teacher and shepherd, watchman, scotchman, Spaniard, Turk, butcher and baker and grocery clerk. They took time off as Christmas near, all except me, so it appeared. That saint or not, it's time me, I got my very first vacation in a thousand years. Out in the stable nuzzling hay, the reindeer dream of Christmas day, but Sandy phoned to the reindeer's gloom, Hang up them harness in the big storeroom. He called to his elf. He told each gnome, cover up them shelves. We're going to stay home. What? Cover the shelf? cried Norman elf. Cover the doll and electric train, and the rocking horse with shaggy mane, and the rubber boot for splashing in park, and the cowboy suit and the new arm. Huh? Alas and alack, but they could not believe he would not go riding on Christmas Eve. Put him away, a raw sandy effect. This year's present will do for next. Warn the people, she tell the paper, me I'm much too tired for Christmas cake. Bringing my back, a cold that linger, aching my toe and all ten finger, bit of lumbago, touch of God. Climbing down Shimley is simply art. I may be the saint of the cheering nation, but this is the year of my very first vacation. Well, you can imagine, more or less, what happened when that news reached the press. Headline scream, why I went humming. Sandy said, too tired, not coming. And as the word flashed far and wide, you should have heard how them 
cheer and cry. So violently they sobbed their grief, the shop ran out of handkerchief. Let tear fill up the kitchen sink, and cellar and empty skating rink. They wept in school, at play they wept. They dug on their pillow while they slept. Oh, little darling, I got dry out. All the river rose three feet high. In me, I don't know what would have happened quite, except for Ignatius Tistle White. Ignatius Tistle White was a boy in Texas, a wicked Illinois. Six year old, but brave for his year. He sobbed no sob, and he wept no tear, but stood up tall in his class to say, Sandy, deserve a holiday. No, 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 came the cheer and play. What is Christmas without our say? Shut now, fella. Gosh, good gracious. Christmas is Christmas, cried Ignatius. And everyone tell me, whom me I met, it's a day to give as well as to get. Since all these years in the cheering's cause, Sandy's been giving without one pause. Let's pull together in the Christmas weather and give this one to Sandy. Hooray, his classmate said. He's right. Three cheers for Ignatius Tisselbrand. As an American cheer and all that happy message around the world. Oh, each continent, island, east, let's give Sandy a Merry Christmas. Which snow the earth was already whitening, but they rolled up their sleeve and worked like lightning. They opened them piggy bank, racked them brain. They shot a bus and special train and ship and sledge and hydroplane to reach the pole by the 24th. Was all their gold, east, south, west, and north, came gift and gift and gift to spare from clever cheering everywhere. Slip up, with zip up, to zip on, soap for a bath or to slip on. Uranium peak in a pot, one guppy, a puppy named Spot, balsam pillow, strawberry jam, dressing gown with his monogram. Ten harmonica for him to play on, hand paint picture done in crayon. Muffler pipe and he's a chair, and a lot of winter underwear in New York State. Shelf 
remain. All the sack and pluck away into one place left the Christmas sleigh. Then Sandy gazed from floor to rap and gave his mighty shout of laughter.
I sat the little train and hauled it down and tore I felt. Then the little clown called out, the passenger engine is not the only one in the world. Here is another engine coming. A great, big, strong one. Let us ask him to help us, huh? The little boy clown waved his flag and the big, strong engine brought itself to a stop. Please, oh, please, big engine, for all the darn and toy together. Won't you please pull our train over them mountain, huh? Our engine had broke itself down, and the good little girl and boy on the other side won't have any Christmas toy to play with or goody to eat unless you help us. But the big, strong engine bellowed. Me? I'm a freight engine. I have just pulled a big freight train load with big machine over the mountain. These machine print book and newspaper for grown up to read. Me, I'm a very important engine indeed. I won't pull the lack of you. And the freight train engine puff out indignantly to the round house. The little train and all the darling toy were very sad. Cheer up, cried the toy clown. The freight engine is not the only one in the world. Here come another. And he looked very old and tired. But our train is so little, perhaps he can help us, huh? The little toy clown waved his flag and the dingy, rusty old engine stopped itself. Please, kind engine, cried all the darling toy together. Won't you please pull our train over the mountain, huh? Our engine done broke itself down, and the girl and boy on the other side won't have any toy to play with, or good to eat, unless you help us. But the rusty old engine sighed. I am so tired, I must rest my weary wheel. I cannot pull even so little a train as yours over the mountain. I cannot, I cannot, I cannot. And off he rumbled it around her shugging, I cannot. Then indeed the little train was very, very sad, and the doll and toy were ready to cry. But the little clown called out, here's another engine coming, a little blue engine, a very little one. Maybe she will help us. And the very little engine came shug, shug, shugging very along. When she saw the toy clown flag, she stopped very quickly at What's the matter, my friend? She asked kindly. Oh, little blue engine, cried the doll and toy, will you pull us over the mountain, huh? Our engine has broke itself down, and the good girl and boy on the other side won't have any Christmas toy to play with. A good to eat unless you help us. Please, please help us, little blue engine. I'm not very big, said the little blue engine. They use me only for switching train on the yard. I've never been over the mountain. But we must get over the mountain before the cheering awake, said all the doll and toy. The very little engine looked up and saw the tear in the doll's eye. And she told the good little boy and girl on the other side of the mountain who would not have any Christmas toy or goodies unless she had. Then she said, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. And she hitched herself to the little train. She dug and pulled and pulled and dug. And slowly, 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 they started off. The toy clown jumped aboard and all the darling toy animals began to smile and cheer. Puff, puff, shuck, shuck with the little blue engine. I think again, 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 I think again. Up, 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 faster and faster and faster and faster. The little engine climbed until at last they reached the top of the mountain. Down in the valley lay the city. Hooray, hooray, cried the funny little clown and all the doll and toy. The good little girl and boy in the city will be happy because you helped this kind, wonderful little blue engine. And the little blue engine smiled and seemed to say as she puffed steadily down the mountain, I thought I could, I thought I could, I thought I could, I thought I could, I thought I could.